Hi everyone, this video is part one of the unit two series on biological bases of behavior. This particular video will cover just a short history of biological psychology and how people today study the mind. So to begin with is a little bit of history. There was a study in the early 1800s called phrenology, and phrenology is kind of like the early roots of understanding the mind as far as the, the functions of the parts of the mind. So prior to phrenology, people questioned where is the source of the mind? Is, is it in the heart? Is it in the head? And in the early 1800s, physician Franz Gall proposed that maybe by studying the bumps and the surfaces of the skull, we could reveal people's mental abilities, their personalities, their character traits. And he mapped out areas of the surface of the skull and the different shapes of the surface of the skull than he believed revealed things about people's character traits. And uh, this was something that was widely believed in the early 1800s. That, and it was very popular. It's obviously um, not something people believe today, but it was kind of these early ideas and that there might be localized areas for possible uh, mental functions. So today we know that inside the skull, within the brain, we have parts of this organ called the brain that have really specific functions. And we've learned that over time. And so how have we gotten there? Well, we start with case studies. So prior to these brain scans that we have today, we have great technology today that can tell us all about the mind. But prior to that technology, we started to learn about the mind through case studies. So one really great example of that is the case study of Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a young man working on the railroads in the mid 1800s. And as he was working on the railroad, a terrible accident happened where a tamping iron, like a spike, um, shot up through his cheekbone and out the top of his skull. And miraculously, Phineas Gage lived. Um, what, what was so strange was not only did he survive this incident, but he was very different afterwards. So he, I mean, survived miraculously where he could walk and talk and almost do all of his normal activities again, except his personality was so different. He was once really respectable and honorable, um, a very hard worker. And then after his incident, people described him as irritable and profane and rude. And they knew that something with that injury affected his personality and his behavior. And so this case study led people to believe that there must be parts of the brain that are responsible for, for that in some way. And today we know and we understand that the frontal lobe, the front part of your brain, is responsible for decision making and judgments. And the inner part of your brain um, is responsible for those emotions like anger and and he severed that connection between judgment making and decision making and those um, very deep emotional feelings. And so he wasn't able to regulate those. And so we know that today, but then it was an early step for us to understand that parts of the brain um, actually are responsible for really specific functions. The term lesion is uh, just a term that means uh, a damage to the brain. Now, today, surgeons can actually create small lesions when they are purposely trying to maybe sever um, specific areas or connections, but a lesion can also just refer to damage to the brain. Now we're going to go into ways that we have moved on today that we can study and look at and examine the brain to understand more about the functions. So we're going to start with this type of brain scan. It's called a CT scan or a CAT scan. And CT scans take multiple 2D x-ray slices. And then it kind of helps form this three-dimensional image. And this type of of image that you get of the brain shows 
hard tissue so you can see the skull really 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 well a lot more clearly than the soft tissue so you might notice while you're looking at these um, these these 2D scans as it's going through, you can see those hard tissues very clearly. The soft tissues you can see in there, but you might not be able to make out every part of the soft tissue. So this is really good for detecting damage or even if there's a growth, um, and, and that would be why you might use a CT scan. Next is an MRI. An MRI scan is going to uh, allow you to see the soft tissues of the brain really well. So as you're noticing, looking at these slices, you can see how well you can see those valleys and ridges of the cerebrum. You can even see the brain stem in there. You can make out the cerebellum uh, and you can see those soft tissues so very clearly and so very well. Um, an MRI is um, a, a scan that's using a strong med magnetic field to develop this image. And this, like I said, is great for soft tissues and looking at the different parts of the brain. The next, the next type of scan is a PET scan. It stands for positron emission technology. And this is a type of scan where um, radioactive tracers are injected through the bloodstream and they pull up where activity is happening. And so if we're looking at the brain, you can see this particular scan uh, in this particular person's brain, there was a lot of activity here. You can see the reds and the yellows. This is where those tracers are pooling up. And this scan, it's going to go where the higher activity in the blood is flowing. And so we can see um, possibly if we're wanting to understand um, you know, whether someone, when someone is, is, is thinking, maybe you're showing images and you want to um, see where their brain is active when they're looking at those images or those faces. Um, that can help you see what parts of the brain are active when they're viewing those images uh, if you're using um, a PET scan. The next type of brain scan that helps us understand the brain is an fMRI. This is a functional MRI and the functional MRI is much like a combination of the MRI. So you can see the MRI here where you can see this uh, soft tissues so very clearly, but it's also like a PET scan. So it's like a combination between a PET scan and an MRI where you can also see that localized activity. So just like the PET scan where you can see the places in the brain where the brain is active, we can also make out that soft tissue really, really well. So the fMRI is like the best of the PET scan and the MRI together. Now there is another type of scan that's going to help us understand brain activity, but it's going to help us understand the electrical activity. So this is called an EEG and an EEG is going to detect the electrical waves that show brain activity. So this isn't going to show you a picture of the brain, but it's going to show you a, a recording or a record of the brain activity. So you can see here, this person is wearing the electrodes on this scalp cap and the electrodes are picking up the electrical activity of the brain. Someone might do this for a sleep study to detect the activity of the brain during sleep, but basically it's going to give a record of the activity. The next part of the video is just some important, a list of important terms as we go into this unit called biological psychology and the biological basis of behavior. Just some important terms for us and just building that foundation of understanding these biological terms. So just to start with, what is biological psychology? This is the scientific study of the link between our biology, so our genetics, our neural processing, our hormones, anything that's making up our body and how that is connected to our psychological processes. Sometimes you might call someone who studies this a biological psychologist, you might call them a neuroscientist or maybe a, a behavioral geneticist, um, but this person is studying the link between biology and psychology. Now, another important term that we've learned already is the biopsychosocial approach, which is a really common approach that's going to take into account an interaction of a lot of different things. What that, and those different factors will be your biology, your social interactions, and your psychological um, state. And so all of those factors will be taken into account within the biological or the biopsychosocial approach. So let's go a step further. One thing that biological psychology really tries to take apart and sift through is the debate 
of nature versus nurture. Nature versus nurture is kind of a, a, a simple way of saying this, what is the connection between our genetics and the role that our biology plays in our uh, behavior and what is the role that our environment plays? And that's so difficult for psychologists to um, determine uh, if someone's actions are the result of their upbringing or are someone's actions the result of biological influences. So next is just a few more terms about uh, just genetics. Now as we're getting into biological psychology, we're going to talk a lot about uh, what role does our biology play in our behavior. And so some of these terms that are important, uh, behavioral genetics or behavior genetics, this is maybe just kind of like the um, big broad term for studying nature versus nurture. Um, and, and it's just studying the interplay between our, um, our genes and our environment. So we will talk about some of these terms in, in depth later, but just to kind of break down what, what are our genetics and what is that. So our DNA is our genetic material. It's given to us by our parents and our DNA has 46 chromosomes within our DNA and 23 chromosomes come from our mother and 23 from our father and, and those make up our DNA. Those chromosomes are kind of thread-like structures and this is what makes up our genes. And if we were to put all of our genes like together to understand like all of our genetic makeup from head to toe, um, we would call that our genome. So our, your genome is your complete set of genetic material for an organism. Uh, a human genome is, is different from a dog genome. Uh, your genome is what makes you the organism you are. Now with psychology, what's so important, like I said, the interplay between nature and nurture and trying to understand if we're studying intelligence, for example, and trying to understand is intelligence a result of your genetics or a result of some environmental factor. That is so hard to determine because obviously experimenting on humans is just, there are so many things you just aren't able to do. Uh, but when, when studying humans, we can, there are certain humans that are really helpful that you can control variables with, and those humans are twins. So twins are really, really great people to study in psychology because twins have very similar genetic makeup. And so, um, you know, you can't take two um, people and, and, and test their intelligence and then determine um, between them now from these two people, what is it genetics or is it their upbringing? Because they have different upbringings and different genetics. But if we study twins and their intelligence and the differences between their intelligence, then we can kind of try to decide is this nature? Is this nurture? Um, and so twin studies are, are just really, really helpful for psychology. So there are two different types of twins. There are monozygotic twins. Monozygotic twins are twins that come from one or monozygote. And so this, this would be identical twins. Identical twins occur when a single egg is fertilized and that single egg separates into two embryos. And so th those two people share identical DNA. Uh, and they came from the same egg. And so what's really incredible about doing personality tests or intelligence tests with identical twins are they share the same genetic uh, material. And so they, they, we can really see when we're testing personality or genetics, how, or personality or intelligence, how much of that is genetic. So that's really great. Dizygotic twins are twins that are, are originate from two zygotes um, or two eggs and then are fertilized. They develop together um, and then they are born together, but they, they came from two separate eggs. All right, lastly is heritability and epigenetics. Heritability is the likelihood that a trait is caused by your genetics. So like what extent is um, personality related to your genes? If personality is really heritable, then that means it was likely due to your genetics. Uh, or if intelligence, if you get your intelligence from your parents, we would say that's heritable. 
Epigenetics is this study of how environment can influence your gene expression. And so uh, this is a really interesting study. How, how can being exposed to something in, in your environment like turn on or turn off some kind of gene expression? Okay, we're at the end of the video. 